The title of tonight's lecture is Hidden Agendas because that's exactly what this is about. It's about hidden agendas. In the previous lectures we spoke about the origin of secret societies and how they are controlled. And we saw that they originate from Babylon, which gave rise to Kabbalism and also to Islamic secret societies, the Ismailis, the Kamatites, the Fatimites, the Druzes and the Assassins, which we haven't dealt with as such. Out of Kabbalism eventually came Gnosticism, which replaces Jesus Christ with a universal Messiah, who today is called the Cosmic Christ. And this Cosmic Christ has none of the attributes of the Jesus Christ of the Bible, but in order to make him acceptable to the world, everybody will have to accept him. That means Jesus Christ, even amongst Christians, will have to be brought lower to a level of this cosmic Christ to accommodate all others who want to be his equal. According to Eliphas Levi, Gnosticism was founded by Simon Magus, who was a sorcerer and put on a cloak of Christianity. He was the one who had himself baptized, but he was rebuked by Peter for wanting to buy the Holy Spirit. So, a cloak of Christianity covered Gnosticism. Out of this philosophy, eventually it became formalized and the Knights Templars, within a large religious system, were the harborers of the ancient philosophy. In other words, they were the harborers of the secret of Gnosticism. They had very close ties with uh, the Islamic societies, and eventually we saw that the Knights Templars were suppressed by the King of France. Many of them escaped, however, to Spain, where the King in Spain gave them his protection and they flourished further and their rites and rituals and degrees were perpetuated in subsequent organizations. So the Templars nev never really died other than in name. The Templar secret knowledge was kept alive in an inner circle in Rosicrucianism and overseen by the Jesuit order. The Jesuit order then created Freemasonry, as we saw on Sunday, and uh, Freemasonry is the so-called Protestant arm, if you like, although it's not only a Protestant arm, it is an international arm, to bring about those changes which are necessary to set up this dark kingdom. So tonight we're going to have a look at Freemasonry, and look behind the scenes as to what it really entails. Because most Freemasons, like in all secret societies, are fully unaware of what happens behind the scenes. You will remember that uh, Gary H. Carr, in his work on route to global occupation, gave a very similar uh, expose. He also takes it through Kabbalism, Gnosticism to the Knights Templars. Then he misses out on the, the Jesuit connection, which is the military powerful arm controlling all these things. And he has Freemasonry control Marxism, American European secret political societies, international banking elite, and then, scarily, the World Council of Churches. Now this is not me saying this, this is this man, and he is uh, no small fish. And, uh, Theosophical societies, together with many cults, then constitute what is known as the New Age Movement. And the New Age Movement is much larger than what we believe just to be uh, a few esoterics doing their thing. It culminates in an entire system which is to unite the entire world, and the World Council of Churches will play a very prominent role in this mechanism. So it's very important that we know what Freemasonry stands for. The outer shell of Freemasonry proposes 
to sell whatever religion is prominent in that area. So, for example, if you are living in a Muslim country and you belong to Freemasonry, then the religion that is propagated at the level of the people and at the level, the lower level of Freemasonry will be Islam. If you are living in a Jewish environment, then of course the religion will be Judaism. If you are living in a Christian environment, environment then the Bible will be the central book in a lodge and as far as the lower echelon of the members is concerned, Christianity will be the basis for the movement. But in actual fact, if it is controlled by an, another power inside, then the picture can be totally different. Now, I'm going to quote tonight from the very, very best sources. I'm not going to use any hearsay. I'm not going to use thus said so and so and so and so about so and so through so and so. No, we're going to go to the original sources, the very best. The book Morals and Dogma is a book written by Albert Pike. It is considered the central theology of Freemasonry. Only the highest Freemasons receive this book and upon their death this book must be returned to the Lodge. So this is not something that is readily available. Today you can go on the internet and you can order Morals and Dogma, but you will never receive the real McCoy. Unless you by chance happen to find someone where a Freemason has died and the book had never been returned and after a few generations somebody finds it. And some of these copies are actually floating around. And uh, there you can find the original information. In my own case, I have many documents because my father-in-law was very, very high up in these issues and when he died, I obtained a fair amount of information that would probably not be available to most people and uh, in my researches for many, many years, I searched for the original documents so that we can have it out of the horse's mouth. So if you feel upset about what I'm saying tonight, remember I will be saying nothing. I will be quoting. And then you make your own minds up as to whether this is so or whether this is not so. Morals and Dogma, the very highest source in Freemasonry. Page 870. The Templars, like all other secret orders and associations, had two doctrines. One concealed and reserved for the masters, which was Johannism. The other public, which was the Roman Catholic. It's quite straightforward. So there is a doctrine that is being taught to the masses, and the masses are the uninitiated. Marx called them cattle. They are also called catacumens. They are called goyim. They are called all kinds of derogatory names. Now, if the outer shell, the teaching of the Templars to the people, was Catholicism, they also, of course, adopted a very pious garb and pretended this was the crux of their religion. But on the inside, they had another religion, and the order that they ascribe to is Johannism. Now we have many orders of St. John today. Many orders. Well, just think about some of the large organizations. We have cathedrals to St. John, where some very strange things happen, as we will see as we go along over time. We have St. John's Ambulance, for example. You know, we could go on and on and on and on, but I don't want to go into too much detail here. All of these are organizations which are philanthropic, seem to be doing a very good thing. They run many, many hospitals. They give huge sums of money to the poor and to the, to the, uh, well, whatever, to children's hospitals, to the crippled people in the world. And being so philanthropic, it is very hard to pin something negative 
to organizations that appear to do so, so much good. And this is actually the best cloak into which to clothe something else that should not be discovered. So whenever you see Johannism, supposedly of course, from John the Baptist, then I it with suspicion. So two doctrines, one to the outside and one to the inside. Morals and Dogma, page 820. The Templars were gravely accused of spitting upon Christ and denying God at their receptions, of gross obscenities, conversations with female devils, and the worship of monstrous idol. Now we discussed that in the previous lecture. The end of the drama is well known, and how Jacques de Malay and his fellows perished in the flames. But, now this is the highest source of Freemasonry. But before his execution, the chief of the doomed order organized and instituted what afterwards came to be called the occult, hermetic, or Scottish masonry. You cannot get a higher source than this. So according to Albert Pike, Freemasonry continued the legacy of the Templars. In the gloom of his prison, the Grand Master created four metropolitan lodges at Naples for the east, at Edinburgh for the west, at Stockholm for the north, and at Paris for the south. The initials of his name, JBM, found in the same order in the first three degrees, are but one of the many internal and cognate proofs that such was the origin of modern Freemasonry. That's from the horse's mouth. So the Templars aren't really dead, but still alive. In fact, in the York Rite, there is a, a level which is the Templar level. So everything is there. The 32nd degree of Masonry, Sublime Prince of the Royal Secret, that's the highest level of Scottish Freemasonry. There is one higher degree, the 33rd degree, but that is an honorary degree. So the highest level of Freemasonry is the 32nd. Again, Morals and Dogma, the occult science of the ancient Magi was concealed under the shadows of the ancient mysteries. It was imperfectly revealed, or rather disfigured, by the Gnostics. They don't show the whole picture. It was guessed at under the obscurities that covered the pretended crimes of the Templars, and it is found enveloped in enigmas that seem impenetrable in the rites of the highest masonry. Do you have that? So out of the horse's mouth, the mystery of the ancient Magi and the uh, shadows of the ancient mysteries are present and known to the highest levels of Freemasonry. None of the lower levels know anything about this. They come into the lodge and they think it is a, a Christian society with, well, at least with Christian flavor, if then a Christian lodge and that they are a brotherhood for doing good unto others. Well, this is San Salvador, this is in uh, Mallorca, where the Templars, of course, found protection under the Spanish kings. And uh, if you go into the Templar enclave, you will find on the altars of the churches, remember that the Templars were an order of the Roman Catholic Church, like the Jesuits are today, the most powerful order within the church, so they were the most powerful order in the church that controlled not only the military aspects, because they were knights, but they also controlled the financial aspects. And the double-headed eagle was part and parcel of their symbolism. Two heads. Janus had two heads. He looked forwards and he looked backwards. If you go into the other churches, you will find them on the altars. There it is above the altar of the churches on Mallorca. Now this is Rosicrucianism. The rose is a symbol of their deity. Now, I really don't get too upset about symbols. If I had to be upset about every symbol, I would have to throw everything out of my house or anything that is manufactured because they all have the symbols on them. We are living in this world, but we don't have to be part of this world. And we can do things, whether there's a symbol on or not, because obviously a symbol means nothing. But it's just interesting to know. It's like reading another language. Well, here are some of the occult teachings of Rosicrucianism. 
where you have the zifferots, the levels that you can attain to, and this is pure Kabbalism. Now you must understand that in the Kabbalah, it is not Yahweh who is the true ruler, it is Lucifer who is the true ruler. But we will come to that as we come later. And the zifferots are emanations of his uh, appearance. So let's ask morals and dogma again, what it has to say about the Kabbalah, which by the way is called the most holy Kabbalah today. The Talmud is called the Holy Talmud, and the Bible is just called the Torah. Isn't that strange? The Bible is called the Torah, and then a book of rules that never appear in the Bible is called the Holy Talmud, and an occult book is called the Most Holy Kabbalah. And I would like to venture so far as that there are very, very, very few rabbis in the world today that are not Kabbalists, which is scary. The Holy Kabbalah, or tradition of the children of Set, this is of course not true. According to this doctrine, then Set would have been an apostate already. Or they turn it round, they say not an apostate, an initiate. So there's an internal doctrine for the initiate and a public doctrine for the goyim, for the cattle, just to keep them occupied. Tradition of the children of Set was carried from Chaldea by Abraham, taught to the Egyptian priesthood by Joseph, recovered and purified by Moses, concealed under symbols in the Bible, revealed by the Savior to St. John, there you have it again, the Johansenites, and contained entire under hieratic figures analogous to those that all it took it in the apocalypse of that apostle. Okay. So now, he's turned everything around. Abraham, Joseph, Moses were all initiates. And what they taught to the people was drivel. Let's put it that way. To keep them happy and to keep them uninformed. But on the inside, they had another doctrine. Now that's of course not true, because Moses wrote the Torah. And everything they believe is the opposite of what the Torah teaches. And the Kabbalah, that book, turns the Torah upside down and makes it occult. The three great lights of the Lodge are symbols to us of the power, wisdom and beneficence of the deity. They are also symbols of the first three Sifarots emanations of this deity, according to the Kabbalah. So the Kabbalah is very, very central in this uh, story. We read on, every Masonic lodge is a temple of religion. Although they are told that it is not a temple of religion, here Morals and Dogma says it is a temple of religion. And its teachings are instructions in religion. This is true religion revealed to the ancient patriarchs. Now we've seen that they've turned the ancient patriarchs upside down into occultists in order to sell this to the people, of course. Which masonry has taught for many centuries and which it will continue to teach as long as time endures. Okay, thank you. Let's ask some questions and we'll ask masonry to answer it. And the sources we will use are only the highest Masonic writings. And the, the Freemasons that will be uh, asked to give answers will be of only the very highest degree. So Albert Mackey, he wrote the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. You cannot get a better source than that. Most of the best lodges, the greatest lodges, have the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. And he was a 33 degree Freemason, which means he was an initiate. Is Freemasonry a Christian organization? If Freemasonry were simply a Christian institution, the Jew, the Muslim, the Brahmin, the Buddhist could not conscientiously partake of its illumination. So it's not a Christian institution. So why is the Bible there? It's there as a symbol, as we saw, of the first three Sephirots. Is it Christian? Freemasonry is not Christian, nor a substitute for it. Well, what is it then? Morals and dogma. Rejecting all the wild and useless speculations of the Zendavesta, the Kabbalah, the Gnostics, and the schools are the religion and philosophy of Masonry. You cannot get it plainer than that. <coughs> so in other words, the Kabbalah is the religion of Masonry. But the Kabbalah is used in such a way that the people believe that 
what they believe is what's in the Bible. Masonry is a search of the light. The search leads us directly back, as you can see, to the Kabbalah. In that ancient and little understood medley of absurdity and philosophy, the initiate will find the source of many doctrines. All truly dogmatic religions, that includes Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, all of them, have issued from the Kabbalah and returned to it everything scientific and grand and the religious dreams of all the Illuminati, the ones that are illuminated. This is Luciferian language. Jacob Burma, Swedenborg, St. Martin and others is borrowed from the Kabbalah. All the Masonic associations owe to it their secrets and their symbols. Straightforward. There can be no doubt about these issues. The true Mason is therefore not creed-bound, cannot say he's a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew. He realizes with the divine illumination of his lodge that as a Mason his religion must be universal. Christ, Buddha or Muhammad, the name means little for he recognizes only the light and not the bearer. He worships at every shrine, bows before every altar, whether in the temple, mosque or cathedral, realizing with his truer understanding the oneness of all spiritual truth. That's Manly Palmer Hall, the last keys of Freemasonry. Can you see where World Council of Churches could come in with something like this? Joining all the religions together? Can, does it start to make a little sound, a little ring a bell or whatever? Well, let's continue. Five points of fellowship, foot to foot, knee to knee, breast to breast, hand to back, mouth to ear. These are identical to those used in the Druidic rite of witchcraft. And very similar to those used in other rites, such as the Gardenian Alexandrian rites. Now, Alexandria, that's where the occult knowledge was maintained. It was maintained in Alexandria and in Rome. Everything else in between was destroyed. We'll come to that a little later. There where Christianity flourished, it no longer exists. Islam exists there. And from Alexandria and later from Rome, emanated the new religion. Passing a secret name or chant from mouth to ear is ancient magical practice reflected in the Hebrew word Kabbalah. So it's a secret religion. Now why is the King James Bible on the altar? Masonry has nothing to do with the Bible. It is not founded upon the Bible, for if it were, it would not be Masonry, it would be something else. The Digest of Masonic Law, page 207 to 209. So it's not the Bible. The Bible is there as a what? As a symbol. But what about God and His Son Jesus Christ? Humanity in toto then is the only personal God. Here again we are talking about high Masons revealing their information. Humanity. Have you heard of the Humanist Manifesto and humanism in general? Right, this is a fascinating quote from Morals and Dogma. I read this entire book. It's the most heavy reading I've ever done in my life. I wouldn't suggest anybody reads it. It's such a pain in the neck, but nevertheless. The Bible is an indispensable part of the furniture of a Christian lodge. This isn't the original, this cursor. Only because it is the sacred book of the Christian religion. The Hebrew Pentateuch in a Hebrew lodge and the Quran in a Mohammedan one belong on the altar. And one of these and the square and the compass properly understood are the great lights by which a mason must walk and work. Okay, which one? Which one of the three is the great light? Well, you have three choices. It could be the Bible, it could be the Pentateuch, or it could be the Quran. I won't reveal it to you tonight, but it'll get clear which one it is. Masonry teaches that redemption and salvation are both the power and the responsibility of the individual Mason. Saviors like Hiram Abif, they have a ritual where they go through the raising of uh, Hiram Abif, can and do show the way, but men must always follow and demonstrate each for himself his power to save himself. 
to build his own spiritual fabric in his own time and way. Every man, in essence, is his own saviour and redeemer, for he does not save, if he does not save himself, he will not be saved. All right, now it's getting a little bit clearer. Do we need Jesus Christ in all of this? Not really. The Masonic author Pearson admits, the Masonic legend stands by itself, unsupported by history or other than its own traditions, yet we recognize, readily recognize, in Hiram Abif, this is the one who is symbolically raised from the dead when a Mason in his ritual is called out of the coffin to rise up and uh, receive new life. We recognize Osiris of the Egyptians, the Mithras of the Persian, the Bacchus of the Greek, Dionysius of the Fraternity of the Artifice, and Attis of the Phrygians, whose passion, death, and resurrection were celebrated by these people, respectively. So in other words, the ancient religion which counterfeited the religion of salvation in Jesus Christ is the religion of masonry. So it's the old pagan religion which has another deity. Now how do we know if all of these have this, exactly the same ritual that Jesus went through, how do we know which one is right? The answer is the book of Daniel in chapters 8 and 9 give the precise time when the Messiah would be born and the circumstances. And that is why the Jews have placed a curse on anyone who numbers the 70 weeks because then you would find out who the real Messiah is. So none of these could qualify for a Messiah because none of them had been predicted to the letter. So if we look at their symbolism, you will find it there. You will find the obelix, which is a symbol of the male organ of Osiris, which got lost when he was disseminated, and Isis put him together and built the missing piece. Well, let's not go into too much detail. Anyway, she did manage to get pregnant by it and give birth to Horus. So here we have the Egyptian. You will see here the, the Torah, the Ten Commandments. You'll see uh, candlesticks, you'll see pyramids, you'll see Egyptian worship, you will see sun worship, all of it in their symbolism. Here is a ritual of the raising of Hiram Abif. Here is the book, The History of Freemasonry. And you'll notice the symbol over there at the top, the all-seeing eye, which is also the symbol of the Jesuits. Remember, in the previous lecture, we showed that the Jesuit order created Freemasonry, wrote its rituals, and we gave all the quotes. Everything has been done. You can look it up in the previous lecture. So I'm not going to go into that detail. Here are some of the symbols that they use. And uh, we can look at some of them. The symbols come to have two meanings. Remember, everything we're using here is a bona fide quote. The esoteric and the exoteric. The esoteric meaning was the true or original meaning understood only by a few. And closely guarded by them. The exoteric meaning, that's for the goyim, for the cattle, for the stupid ones, the uninitiated, was the invented or modified explanation intended for the many. The sacred mysteries, which are often mentioned in connection with many ancient religions and which were closely guarded by the initiate, concerned esoteric meanings in the religions of previous times. These sacred mysteries were often were merely continuations of the simpler forms of the early sex worship carried on by a select few. Well, in the previous lecture we saw rituals going on where people today gather naked in forests, and that includes the presidents of the countries that rule the world today, and we saw that in the previous lecture. Nothing has changed. Are Masonic, Masonic initiates misled? What about poor Mason himself? Let's go to the best source in the world, Morals and Dogma, page 819. The blue degrees, that's the first three degrees of Freemasonry, are but the outer court of the portico of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is, will you note this, intentionally misled by false interpretation. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. 
No wonder they don't give this book to the lower initiates. That would freak them out, right? Their true explication is reserved for the adepts, the princes of masonry, the whole body of the royal and sacerdotal art was hidden so carefully centuries since in the high degrees. There you have it. Only the high degrees know what is going on. This is the horse's mouth. Nobody can argue with that. I've had many masons be very angry with me, but in the end I've had to admit this, this is the real McCoy. This is it. I know many, many masons have become good Christians as a consequence of these lectures. So they are important. There are many, many people that belong to the Masonic fraternity. Many, many people. Masonry, like all the religions, all the mysteries, hermeticism and alchemy, conceals its secrets from all except the adepts and sages or the elect and uses false explanations and misrepresentations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve only to be misled. Basically stupid. We're just using you to conceal the truth which it calls light from them and to draw them away from it. Truth is not for those who are unworthy or unable to receive it or would pervert it. So masonry jealously conceals its secrets and intentionally leads conceited interpreters astray. Morals and Dogma, page 104-105. There you have it. Straight from the horse's mouth. Here's a high mason book in Germany. And... Uh, it tells us there exactly what they do. A Freemason, this is what stands there, formed out of the materials of his lodge, behold a master mason rare, whose mystic portrait does declare, the secrets of Freemasonry fair for all to read and see, but few there are to whom they're known, though they so plainly here are shown. So this is a language that you have to learn. They created this language because God confused the languages, so they created a language in symbolism that God would not be able to confuse in future. That's their logic. Now let's have a look at some of the symbols and see where we get. Crossed swords are part of the symbols. Cornucopia, the horn of plenty. We have pentagrams and uh, compasses and set squares and G's, which they say stand for God, but actually stands for generative principle. It's the male organ, sorry, and the female one, because that's the only way you're going to generate. This stands for the masculine, this stands for the feminine. Now, if you go back into the other religions, if you go to, East, to China, for example, and you look at the, the sun god, so, so the equivalent, in other words, of Isis and Osiris, you will find that they are here. They are Fuxi and Nuwa. There they are on their cave drawings. Here they are. And you will note that Fuxi and Nuwa carry the compass over there and the set square. They are symbols of the male and female deities. That's what it stands for. So the cathedrals of the world, this was just interesting. This one was being repaired. And of course, who would repair it? The company is Eich. But what does that tell us? What kind of company would it be? It's a Masonic company. Right, here you have the apron, and the apron has various symbols on it. You will see there the sun and the moon with the stars around it, and the compass and the set square. And of course, hidden in here, there is the mystic letter M. And uh, that is the sigma on its side. But uh, masonry, of course, starts in every single language in the world, masonry starts with an M. Well, we don't go or through all the details, I just want you to recognize some of them. The keys are very prominent, you'll find them in the religious systems. Mystic towels are very prominent. Uh, pigeons with olive leaves in their, in their mouths, the peat symbol. All of the symbolism comes from masonry. And uh, hammers and sickles, a part of the symbolism of Freemasonry. You know where that occurred, don't you? And uh, here you can set this uh, set square either in the sickle form or in the other form, the all-seeing eye, of course, the pentagram and the pentagon, very prominent. These are occult symbols. Today we have whole buildings that are built like pentagons. You know that? And then you have, of course, the figure of the Johansenite, the St. John, the so-called one, who's really a symbol of something else. 
and it has the X, and then it has the cross. What do you notice about that cross? It's an upside down cross, symbol of victory over Jesus Christ. Now, we'll come to some other details about that in a moment. So hammers and sickles and upside down crosses and G's and all kinds of interesting things, sun, moon, stars, all this symbolism. If you go to the tracing boards, first degree, second degree, and so forth, there's a vast amount of symbolism here. Sun, moon, and stars, if you intercalate those, then you get hexagrams, pentagrams. Uh, the star is in the east. To the uninitiate, it is in, he's informed that it is the star of Bethlehem. But there's, of course, a problem if you just think logically. The Magi came from the east and they walked towards the star. So where was the star of Bethlehem? It was in the west. So this is another one that was in the east. And the Bible condemns the praying towards the east, right? Because that represented the sun god. And this star in the east is none other star than Sirius, the brightest star in the heaven, the luminary. The illuminated one is the symbol of Lucifer. The brightest planet in the, in the heavens is which one? Is Venus. Venus, it's called the morning star. In the morning star name, it is masculine. As Venus, it has a female deity name, it's female. So you have the male and the female connotation right there. The black and white squares represent knowledge of good and evil. Now man has become as one of us, knowing good and evil. And so we can continue right through all the symbolism. We don't have time to go into it all. The two pillars, Yachim and Boaz, supposedly the temple of Solomon's temple's pillars, but these are representations of the ziggurat of Babylon. Serpents encircling rings and globes and issuing from globes are common in the Persian, Egyptian, Chinese and Indian monuments. Vishnu is represented supposed, reposing on a coiled serpent, so many of their symbolism refers to the ancient deities. The serpent with the tail in the mouth is the universal serpent, the life giver. The serpent is the symbol and prototype of the universal saviour who redeems the world by giving creation the knowledge of itself and the realisation of good and evil. Manly Palmer Hall, 33 degree Freemason. So it is the serpent that gives you a knowledge of good and evil and he is the one who is deified. You'll see skulls and babies representing life and death, cycles of life and death, it's a reincarnation. It sees forwards and backwards, often these are half white, half black, representing the knowledge of light and the knowledge of darkness. And whether you worship the dark side or whether you worship the light side doesn't really make any difference. That is why it is interesting that the light side worshippers are known as Luciferians and the dark side are known as witches, wizards and Satanists. And they are the best of friends, because the deity is the same. It doesn't matter which vehicle you use to get to know him, it is the same deity. Cosmic keys, the answer to heaven and uh, Hades. Pagan religious symbols are also very common in Freemasons, Athene, Earth, Cirrus, Hermes, very common one that they use. All Jesuit cathedrals will have the symbol of Hermes. And of course, masonry claims that it uses hermetic rites. Her mes, son of mes, son of ham, if you like, from the very beginning. We haven't got time to go into all the uh, details. So Jupiter, Mars, Mercury, all these symbols represent deities. Morals and Dogma, page 851, the 32nd degree, this is the highest degree. The hermaphroditic figure, there you have him, male, female is the symbol of the double nature anciently assigned to the deity. Now remember that the Knights Templars also worshipped Baphomet, who was a maphrodite, male, female. As generator and producer of Brahm and Maya and Osiris, whatever, we don't have to go into all the details. So if we go through Scottish Rite masonry, the 33rd degree is known as Sovereign Grand Inspector General, it's an honorary degree for the highest masons. And uh, you have to be a high initiate to get into that. And then you get down sublime, sublime Prince of the Royal Secret is the 32nd, and you go all the way down, 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 until you get down here 
to the blue degrees, which are entered apprentice, apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason. And you can go up all the way, almost to the top, and never know what you're doing. Never know what you're actually involved in. There's a youth group in Freemasonry, which is called Demolay. Isn't that fascinating? That is the man who was sentenced to death for spitting on the cross and for committing sodomy and the most profane things under the sun, but that's the youth group. Isn't that interesting that uh, Billy Graham said that the Demolays are the elite of the youth in the world? Fascinating statement. Knights Columbus, we've seen them with their fasci eye. We'll come to that in a later lecture again. Which control the, uh, the world political system, at least in the United States. And, uh, the, the head of a lodge gets to the position of worshipful master. The Bible says you must call nobody master, let alone worshipful master. This violates the first commandment. The headquarters of the Supreme Council of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, Southern Jurisdiction, USA. This is what you have on the front. You have the sphinxes with the serpents on the sides. And this is known as the House of the Temple. On the east side of Northwest 16th Street between R and S Street in Washington, D.C. This is where the High Masons meet. The entire cabinet of the USA will meet there. Whether they are Democrat or Republican makes no difference. That is where the decisions are made. This is a book no, called The Deadly Deception, written by a man, James D. Shaw, who was initiated into the highest degree, the 33rd degree, and later uh, rescinded and left it. 33rd degree initiation ceremony. The oath is sealed by drinking wine out of a human skull. May this wine I now drink become a deadly poison to me as the hemlock juice drunk by Socrates, should I ever knowingly or willfully violate the same. A member dressed as a skeleton places his arms round the candidate who then states, and may these cold arms forever encircle me, should I ever knowingly or willfully violate the same. Here are some of the symbols of Freemasonry. These are the so-called secret symbols. If you look at them, you'll find some of them are very interesting. We're not going to go into all of them. Let's enlarge some of them. If you thought that had something to do with Volkswagen, I suggest you think again. Those are the two Vs, one inside the other, representing the union of the two deities. And if you thought that was the heart of the Union Jack, then you will know now that the Union Jack means that Great Britain is a Masonically controlled country. So is its religion, as we will see. These are all symbols of, uh, this is Aquarius, for example. If you thought that was the Star of David, then ask yourself why before Masonry was around, there was no Star of David. And these symbols over here, of course, very, very prominent. We haven't got time to go into all of these. We're just opening it up. So if you find ecstasy and mandrax tablets being distributed amongst the youth, they will have all these symbols on them. You thought that was Mitsubishi? Symbol? Well, they would be very upset if you thought that they uh, helped to propagate mandrax and ecstasy and the like. And there you have uh, this symbol, this VW symbol, this W that is uh, two Vs locked inside each other. Now, these are occult symbols. In other words, these drugs are being dispensed by an organization that uses the symbols of its religion. And if you thought that this papal choir, choir was sponsored by Volkswagen, you have better think again. That symbol means something else on these innocent little children that are bearing Luciferian symbols. Here is Alistair Crowley's symbolism. You'll see it's very similar. We'll have the pentagram and all the other symbols over there. The G. Uh, you will notice that that is basically the basic structure. And you can fill it in and then you can have a pentagram, you can have it the, that way around, or you could have it the other way around, depending on which you want it. That would be the goat of Mendes, that would be the dark side, also, unfortunately, sorry ladies, the female side, and that would be the male representation. Let's ask the dictionary of mysticism to tell us what this means. The pentagrams considered by occultists to be the most potent means of conjuring spirits. 
When a single point of the star points upward, it is regarded as the sign of the good, and it means to conjure benevolent spirits. When a single point points down, and a pair of points are on the top, it is the sign of the evil Satan, and is used to conjure up powers of evil. That's what it says. It's interesting that this symbol is, of course, used everywhere in the world, including most of the flags. Let's ask another source, Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. You won't get a better source than that. Freemasons of the United States have by tacit consent referred to it, the pentagram, as a symbol of the five points of fellowship. So it's the Pentephala of Pythagoras, the science of the Magi, the Pentephala is called the holy and mysterious pentagram, it's the star of the magicians. So this is occultism, got it all over your flags. Very interesting, double triangles and so forth. You have male, female, good, evil, Adam, Kadmon, all these symbols, the divine man, and now we get to the point where we start revealing what they actually mean. And may God help us as we continue along this road and find out what the hidden agenda of this Freemasonry actually is. We are now going into the actual teaching of Freemasonry. We've just looked at the basic framework. Notice this statement. It is far more important that men should strive to become Christ's than that they should believe that Jesus was Christ. That's pretty straightforward. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, this particular one, this is the Catechism of the Catholic Church, New York Image Books, 1995, page 129, says the following. For the Son of God became man so that we might become God. The only begotten Son of God, wanting to make us sharers in his divinity, assume our, assumed our nature so that he made man might make men gods. Marvel and rejoice, we have become Christ. Now, not all public catechisms will have this, so don't look for it in your general catechism. It's that edition which says it. Because there's an inner teaching and an outer teaching. Don't forget that. Manly Palmer Hall, 33 degree Freemason, says, Man is God in the making. Hinduism teaches this, that through your various incarnations, and Buddhism teaches it, that eventually through Nirvana you become one with the divine, you are divine. Uh, another Masonic writer writes, Be still and know that I am God, that I am God, the final recognition of the all in all, the unity of the self with the cosmos, the cognition of the divinity of the self. So this is the opposite of what the Bible teaches in the beginning. Sin would lead to death, but the serpent said, you will surely not die, you shall be like God. So this is serpent language, this is not God language, this is Lucifer's teaching, this is not God's teaching. The perfect man is Christ, and Christ is God. This is the birthright and destiny of every human soul. J.D. Buck, Mystic Masonry. Notice the symbolism again. You could get the hexagram out of it, and you could get that sign out of it. You can turn it around and put it in front of a car as well, if you like. A triangle with a point down represents the deity and is called the deity's triangle, or the master triangle. With a point up, it is called the earthly triangle, pyramid triangle, or the fire triangle. And this emblem symbolizes the perfect or divine man. So when a religion uses these triangles, in Kabbalism they are saying we are divine. So the Star of David is a in your face God, we are divine. That's a terrible statement I'm making here tonight. That's a terrible statement. With a point upwards, the equatorial triangle stands for Shiva, the destroyer, and signifies the flame which rises upward from the funeral pyre towards heaven. The symbol is familiar to us, the Masons, in several degrees, notably the 30th degree. Notice the higher degrees be get initiated into what is going on. This is Ward, Freemasonry, and the ancient gods. So, Shiva, 
is the God who is there represented. We'll come to that in a moment. So when you see a symbol like this, it's not as simple as it sounds as this Kilbourne Platt showing that Ohio historical markers, these states are all dedicated Masonically. The double-headed eagle we've dealt with already. The 32nd degree makes the double-headed eagle its particular emblem and of course also the 33rd degree. In this sign we conquer is what it says over here, the Maltese cross, also the crown with the cross in it are Masonic symbols and you will find it is the symbol of many churches, particularly Pentecostal churches. Then you have various co-Masonry degrees. For example, this is the symbol used by the Order of the Eastern Star, which is female Freemasonry, which is of course run by male Freemasonry. Freemasonry generally is a white brotherhood, but co-Masonry accommodates females and black people. So to the uninitiate, it seems as if the white race is supreme. Once you get to the high initiates, there is a different story, and Nimrod was worshipped as black or white. There is chaos created between the races, so you have the Ku Klux Klan, which is anti-black, uh, and you have organizations which are equally anti-white, this is called dialectic thinking. Remember the Hegelian principle? You create friction between the races so that you can have synthesis in the end and bring about a new world order. So in order to unite the races, the best thing to do is to create chaos amongst the races until the pain of separation exceeds the pain of unity. Do you understand the Hegelian dialectic thinking? It's brilliant. It's sick, but it's brilliant. And it doesn't matter if you sacrifice hundreds of thousands of lives to achieve your objective, because the end justifies the means. It really is a terrible doctrine. So if we go to co-masonry, this is the symbol of uh, co-masonry. Are the symbols, words, and other Masonic expressions also found within the occult? Yes, they are. They are also used in the Golden Dawn and other societies. As we say, here is the Order of the Eastern Star, here is their main center, the International Headquarters, also known as the International Temple. That is where it is, in Washington, D.C. This is Prince Hall Freemasonry, this is Black Freemasonry. And very often the Masons themselves do not know about all these sub-organizations. So if you go up the ranks of uh, Prince Hall Freemasonry, then you will find Knights Templars up there, for example. Knight Templar? Well, that tells you something, right? So they really use these names. These are their, this is their own uh, page. So this is not something that has been thought up. And the very, very highest individuals in the black world, for example, are Prince Hall Freemasons. Might I mention a name, Nelson Mandela, if you're interested? This is what they look like. So there's no such thing as it just being a white brotherhood, although each one of the groups is individually uh, often non-informed. This is the, the levels. These are the levels in Freemasonry, and we can fill them in. The, the actual levels vary according to the source. This one here is as it was revealed by Ayn Rand who was the girlfriend of uh, Philip Rothschild. Uh, she committed suicide. Humanism is the lowest level, Masons with no aprons, the YMCA, the whole scout movement out there, etc., forms part of Masonic organizations. Rotary, the Lions, the Odd Fellows, well, you have them right next door. The lions, the lions, of course, use the two-headed lion, the Tsianus, the two-headed one, all those symbols. And these are all good organizations that appear to do very good things. Blue Masons, that's John's Masons, there you have the name John again. Get very nervous when you hear it. York Rite, Scottish Rite, Communism, Benibarit, Jewish Masonry, Council of 500, Council of 33, Council of 500, also known as the Bilderbergers, if you like, the Council of 13. And at the highest level, we saw that the papacy is involved because the Jesuits control all of them. 
every single level. Here is the Pope in front of the Boy Scout movement, and this is the feeder organization into other organizations. And none of them know anything about it, so don't accuse them, but have a look at some of their symbolism and see if you find the Masonic symbolism there. You'll find it. Female Masons that were very prominent, of course, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, founder of the Theosophical Society, Annie Besant, Alice A. Bailey, and uh, Alice A. Bailey, her husband, was uh, Foster, he was a 32-degree Freemason, and uh, part of co-masonry. They started a publishing company known as Lucifer Trust, which they later changed to Lucifer's Trust. This is Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, this one over here is Annie uh, Alice A. Bailey, and these are the ones who wrote down the secret of the secret doctrines. Of course, once they achieved the highest degrees, then they would have to be male. So Annie Basant is known as Brother Annie Basant, 33 degree Freemason. The same in the Egyptians, if a, if a female pharaoh became pharaoh, then she was male. So Hatshepsut, for, for example, is figured with a beard, because you had to be an honorary male. You can't be the reincarnation of the sun god if you're a female. So co-masonry, Annie Basant and all these high masons, Alice A. Bailey, high priestess of the New Age movement, received messages from a Tibetan known as Dwal Kul. On her writings, you will find, of course, the Masonic symbols. And these are her writings. And, of course, uh, Blavatsky is the one who wrote Isis Unveiled, uh, Secret Doctrine, and all of these mystic Masonic books, which are virtually impossible to get hold of, although these days you can, if you search, find them. Let me take you to one of the largest lodges in the world, which has become a museum. This one is in Guthrie, in uh, Oklahoma. We'll go inside, you will see swastikas. They will say they are the other way around. Yes, that might be so, but uh, that doesn't mean anything, because the one way around it represents the female aspect, and the other way around it represents the male aspect, so it doesn't make any difference. Uh, you will find the symbol of the sun god Ra, you'll find the all-seeing eyes, and then you'll see the statue. It can be male, it can be female, it makes no difference, you should figure that out by now, with the finger on the mouth. And they will tell you that means secrecy. Don't reveal the secrecies or quiet in the lodge. All kinds of nonsense they will tell you. It's got nothing to do with it. This is only for the initiate to know what this is. What this is. This is the symbol of Horus, and I'll show it to you in a moment. On the floor, you have uh, the various pentagrams in this uh, form over here, and the pentagons. And in front of this statue, it says, all who stand here stand facing the east. Let each review his obligation and renew them in his heart. So this worship is towards the east, which the Bible forbade. Now there's the god Horus. You will notice that he's always depicted with his finger on his mouth. His religion is for the initiate. These are the, uh, the, the dress of the various Masonic levels. The sovereign grand commander has this symbol on the front. And there you have it, on Sovereign Grand Commander Henry Clausen, that it is, that's the symbol of Baphomet. That's Baphomet, the androgenic god, and uh, you will be surprised where Baphomet features these days. I will be showing it to you in future lectures. And of course, it's also on the building over here, which is the headquarters of the Mother Supreme Council of the World, Washington, D.C., where the Constitution for the New World Order has already been written, right there. That's Baphomet, and this is how the symbolism was also used by Alice A. Crowley. In the lodge, you will find IHS. I showed you that was the symbolism for the Jesuit order, Isis Horus Set. Uh, this stained glass window, in the, in the light, it is, uh, in the day, it is white. In the night, it becomes black, a very special technique. And if you know that Osiris was worshipped as black or white, then that explains the story. They have an Egyptian room uh, with all the symbolism that goes along with it. They have an Assyrian room because they represent all the ancient religions. Here is a statue of Albert Pike, 
It's called the Albert Pike Lodge, number 162. To study and seek to interpret correctly the symbols of the universe is the work of the sage and the philosopher. It is to decipher the writing of God. Albert Pike. Now here is his book, Morals and Dogma. I've scanned this in so that people don't say I'm talking hearsay. They must know I have the book. And uh, whatever is quoted over here comes directly from him. In the Scottish Rite, the crown and scepter symbolize a man's dominion over himself. We are God. We don't need anyone else to tell us what to do. The history of man's thought is the only history worth much study. Don't worry about the other one. There's the library. I just photographed it to show you that the history of Freemasonry and the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry are genuine uh, books. The New Age has a magazine has been replaced by Scottish Rite magazine. There's also the symbol over there that we spoke about earlier. And it is to himself alone that man can find enduring happiness. We are our own savior. Again, in this lodge, you will have Jacques de Molay um, honored. Rosicrucianism, the cross on the rose, the one who really suffered was a Cyrus, not Jesus Christ. And uh, there you have the mystic Tao and other symbolism like the lion with eagle wings, symbol of Babylon. And here you have the double-headed eagle in its original black-white form representing the two deities. This is the cornucopia. What does it stand for? It is the symbol of many political organizations. It was the symbol of the organization that expanded and used apartheid. It was the symbol of the National Party in Southern Africa. It's interesting. So, what were they? Let's ask what the cornucopia means. The cornucopia, or horn of plenty, was double-sexed in symbolism. The horn was masculine and the inside was feminine. The fruit inside symbolized productiveness of the female. It's a sex symbol, again, the union of Isis and Osiris. So when we look at these deities, remember, that's Horus, Isis. She's the one who stands on the serpent. Mary is the one who stands in Catholicism on the serpent. And Dionysius as a child is just the same thing. These gods came in the hexagram, in the hexagon, uh, etc. They came in the square. This is the god Harpocrates, or if you like, uh, Horus. There he has the cornucopia in his hand, and the finger is broken off. That points to the mouth, as per usual. Here's another Masonic lodge. Inside, you'll have the same symbolism. You'll have yin-yang signs up against the ceilings. This is the blue room. And uh, there are only three lights in a lodge because the north is the place of darkness. Now, if you know your Bibles, you will know that the north is where the throne of God is. That's the source of darkness. Something's upside down. And the various rooms used by the Scottish Rite and the York Rite, etc., two pillars always representing uh, Yachim and Boaz. On top of it, you'll see the signs of the zodiac, there they are. This uh, shows you what this is. Astrology is a science demanding respect of the scholar, notwithstanding its designation as a black art. And in a reflective sense, in an occult science, this science was known to the ancients as the divine art, the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. So astrology is uplifted by Freemasonry, although the Bible condemns it. Right. From that science, many of the most significant emblems are borrowed. The lodge itself is a representation of the world. It is adorned with the images of sun, moon, and stars. And we can go through the astrological symbols and see that they represent phallic worship as well, made prominent part of the mysteries. These are all Masonic sources. Here is another, the, the Red Room, Freemason initiation ceremonies we saw are identical to how Loyola presented himself to the Pope. So they come directly from the Jesuit rituals. Some of the uh, pomp and grandeur of the lodge you will find represented in the parliaments of the world. Uh, the symbolisms, this one is very prominent. And uh, you will see many organizations use it. Sports people use it. Why? Because the sports companies and the sports superstructures are all Masonically controlled. 
and uh, some of the hand signals. We're not going to go into that. We're going to stick to quotes. Now let's ask them directly. We've seen it in symbolism. We've seen it suggested. You can figure it out if you're really interested, but uh, most people don't actually get there. So let's ask at the higher degree, degree level, tell us directly, who do you worship? Who is the god of masonry? Eliphas Levi, mystery of magic. What is more absurd and more impious than to attribute the name Lucifer to the devil? That is to personify it evil. The intellectual Lucifer is the spirit of intelligence and love. It is the paraclete, the advocate. Isn't that interesting? It is the Holy Spirit where the physical Lucifer is the great angel of universal magnetism. So Lucifer is the Holy Spirit, Lucifer is the parakletos, he is the advocate. The Bible says we have one advocate and that is Christ Jesus. Lucifer represents life, thought, progress, civilization, liberty, independence. Lucifer is the logos, the word, the serpent, the savior. This is a secret doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, pages 171, 225, 255, volume 2. I have them at home. If you don't want to believe me, I can send you a photocopy. It is Satan who is the god of our planet and the only god. These are pretty direct quotes. You won't get around them. Let's go to Albert Pike directly. 30 degree, degree Freemason. Lucifer is the light bearer. Strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning. Is it he who bears the light and with its splendor intolerable, blinds, feeble, sensual or selfish souls? Doubt it not. So who's the god of Freemasonry? Lucifer, Albert Pike, Morals and Dogma. The devil is the personification of atheism or idolatry for the initiate. It's not a person but a force. Do you know a movie where they say the force be with you? I know a movie like that. The Bible says, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, 2 Corinthians. Now let's get into the nitty gritty. This is the instruction to the 23 supreme councils of the world given in 1889. And it reads as follows, Albert Pike, the head of Scottish Freemasonry and the founder of, their, of, of, of that Bible of Freemasonry. That which we must say to a crowd is, we worship a God, but it is the God one adores without superstition. To you, sovereign grand inspectors general, take note of this quote. I'm going to go a bit slower here. To you, sovereign grand inspectors general, we say this that you may repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degree. Notice it says may. It doesn't mean that they do. It means you may. 32nd, 31st, and 30th degree. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the high degrees, be maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. If Lucifer were not God, would Adonai, that's... The other one, that's Jesus, if you like, whose deeds prove his cruelty, pitifully, and hatred of man. He brought the flood. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, that lovely, peace-loving, old-time San Francisco. He just destroyed it. Can you believe that? And his priests culminate him. Yes, Lucifer is God, and unfortunately, Adonai is also God. Because light cannot exist without darkness, blah, 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 blah. So, question. At which level should a mason know who he's worshipping? The 30th, the 31st, the 32nd, and the 33rd degree. A 33 degree Freemason will know who he worships, yes or no? Is that clear? Okay. Now what if I could show you who the 33 degree Freemasons of this world are? Would that change your opinion from one, wow, what a wonderful achievement to, oops, there's something wrong here, yes or no? Is that, do you think that is important? What if you were to find out that the greatest preachers in the world are 33 degree Freemasons, how would you react? How would you react if you found out that the politicians of the world are 33 degree Freemasons, the highest politicians in the world, how would you react? Would it change your perception somewhat? The true name of Satan, the Kabbalists say, is Yahweh reversed. For Satan is not a black god, but the negation of God. For the initiates is not a person, but a force. Albert Pike, Morals and Dogma, page 102. 
To conceive of God, the Kabbalah imagined him to be a most occult light. Albert Pike, Morals and Dogma, page 740. Here is a conjugation addressed to Emperor Lucifer. Emperor Lucifer, master and prince of the rebellious spirits, I adjure thee to leave thine abode and whatever quarter of the world it may be situated and come hither to communicate with me. When the, master, when the mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mastery of his craft, the seething energy of Lucifer in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply energy. He must follow in the footsteps of his forefathers, Tubal Cain, it's an interesting name, we haven't got time to go into all those details, who with the mighty strength of the war god, hammered his sword into a plowshare. So you first create war and chaos so that people will be willing to give it up and join into one giant Luciferian empire. Do you know what irritated the devil most? When God separated the nations. That was a headache to him. It gave him four and a half thousand years of headache. He's been battling for four and a half thousand years to get his act together again. He's got his act together. The devil is now called darkness by the church. Notice that this is a quote from Blavatsky. This is, you cannot get better sources than this. This is Secret Doctrine, page 71. The devil is now called darkness by the church, whereas the, in the Bible he's called the Son of God, the bright star of the early morning, Lucifer, see Isaiah. Oh, they turn everything upside down. I'll show you why in a moment. There's a whole philosophy of dogmatic craft in the reason why the first archangel who sprang from the depths of chaos was called Lux, Lucifer, the luminous son of the morning or man, Vantric Dawn. He was transformed by the church into Lucifer or Satan because he is higher and older than Jehovah and had to be sacrificed to the new dogma. So, what the uninitiate gets is the doctrine of the Bible wash down, and the initiate turns it upside down. The devil is the true God, and Jehovah, Yahweh, is the bad guy. Well, let's see if we can back it up. Blavatsky's Secret Doctrine, page 73. Jehovah, esoterically as Elohim, is also the serpent or dragon that tempted Eve, and the dragon is an old glyph for astral light, primordial principle, which is the wisdom of chaos. Okay, so the devil is the wisdom of chaos, but the real bad guy was who? Jehovah. So the Bible is turned upside down. Now Jehovah tempted Eve and not the serpent. Blavatsky, Secret Doctrine, Volume 2. The philosophical system of the Gnostics and the primitive Jewish Christians, the Nazarenes and the Ebionites are fully considered. They show the view held in these days outside the circle of Mosaic Jews about Jehovah. He was identified by all the Gnostics with evil. So the Gnostics believe that Jehovah is the bad one, Lucifer is the good one. They are Luciferians. Secret Doctrine, Volume 1. The great serpent of the Garden of Eden and the Lord God are identical. So God is the serpent. He's the bad guy. Turn it around. And so are Jehovah and Cain one. The Cain who is referred to in theology as the murderer and the liar to God. So who's the murderer and the liar now? Jesus is the murderer and the liar, and the serpent is the good guy. Well, Secret Doctrine, Volume 2, page 388. The appellation Satan, Hebrew, Satan, an adversary, from the word Shatana, to be adverse, belongs by right to the first and cruelest adversary of all the other gods, Jehovah, not to the serpent, which spoke only words of sympathy and wisdom and is at the worst, even in the dogma, the adversary of men. This is serious stuff. Therefore Jehovah was called by the Gnostics the creator of and one of the ophinomorphs, the serpent, Satan, or evil. Another one, we could go on and on and on and on. He calls him a Jehovah Frankenstein. That's not very nice, wouldn't you say so? Calling my God Frankenstein? The Kabbalists say that the true name of Satan is Jehovah placed upside down. I'll tell you something in the Islamic lecture which will really excite you. Satan is not a black god but the negation of the white deity. 
Now, black and white has got nothing to do with skin color here. It has to do with illumination. And so we could go on. I'm going to show you something else that's interesting here. Jehovah, even the insider knows this. Jehovah becomes Satan and Michael and his army. Satan and the rebellious angels. So Michael, which means the one who is what God is, is Satan and his angels. Hmm. And Lucifer and his angels, he's setting up his kingdom down here. My Bible says Michael is the prince that stands for your people, and he will stand up and come and sort the evil one out, right or wrong. So we've turned the doctrine upside down. Michael being simply Jehovah himself, one of the subordinate spirits at best. They hate Jesus Christ. Just like the Templars, they spit on the cross. Now, if you do not believe the Blavatsky source, let's go to Morals and Dogma, the Masonic source. The deity of the Old Testament is everywhere represented as the direct author of evil. There he says exactly the same thing. I don't have to repeat it. Let's carry on. So little have the first Christians who despoiled the Jews of the Bible understood the first four chapters of Genesis in their esoteric meaning. Now let's go into this. That they never perceived that not only was no sin intended in the disobedience, but actually the serpent was the Lord God. Himself, who was as the Ophos, the Logos, the bearer of divine creative wisdom, taught mankind to become creators in their turn. The serpent was so good to you. You would be still stupid if it wasn't for the serpent. The devil is now called darkness by the church, but the Bible calls him the Son of God. Remember that one? So no wonder Manly Palmer Hall, 33 degree Freemason says, I hereby promise the great spirit Lucifuge, prince of the demons, that each year I will bring unto him a human soul to do with as it may please him. Do you think they might still have human sacrifices? And in return, Lucifuge promises to bestow upon me the treasures of the earth and to fulfill my every desire for the length of my natural life. Manly Palmer Hall, you can have it. I prefer Jesus Christ and eternal life. Official logo of Ordo Templar Orientis. We don't have to go into all these details. Who then is allowed to know the truth about masonry? We must create a super right. Now notice carefully. Which will remain unknown, to which we will call those masons of high degrees, 30 and above, whom we shall select, with regards to our brothers in masonry, these men must be pledged to the strictest secrecy. Through this supreme right, we will govern all Freemasonry, which will become the one international center, the more powerful, because its direction will be unknown. This was a letter from Pike to the head of the Order of the Illuminati, Giuseppe Mancini. So, who governs the world? A super right. George Bush calls them a thousand points of lights, illuminated ones. They don't use this terminology for nothing. They were going to create three world wars. Here's the quote. I'm not going to go into details on this quote right now. There's a lecture coming up, revolutions, dictators, and wars. We'll look at it then. Scary stuff. Ordo Abkao is there statement. That means order out of chaos. The symbol they use for that is the phoenix rising from the ashes. Out of the destruction of what God has put onto this planet, Satan will create his diabolical kingdom where all nations, all religions will become one. Because that's the only way he can have universal rulership. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus says, come out and be separate. They say, come in and be inclusive or else. Wow, it's getting interesting. There's another lecture coming up. Don't miss any of these. This is amazing stuff. If you think that some have said to me, Ordo Abkaos is not 
a Masonic statement. I said, excuse me, I've been in the lodge and photographed their documents. There it is. Ordo ab kao. And if you want to know how we got in there, we just walked in. And there are witnesses at the back that we didn't do this clandestinely. I just went in and I photographed it while my wife was talking to someone and keeping them busy. There it is. Ordo ab kao. This is the main lodge in England. That's the main building. Now, you weren't, I wasn't allowed to take any photographs inside. You can go into the first portions. You couldn't go into the others. But I showed you what it looks like in one of the other lodges anyway, so it doesn't make any difference. Notice that the north is the place of Masonic darkness. The east is where the worshipful master sits, representing this androgenic principle. The south is where the junior warden sits, the west is where the senior warden sits, then there is an altar, and there are three Masonic lights. These are the symbols that you will find on the Masonic Lodge, the compass, the set square, the triangles, the all-seeing eye, all of these. And uh, the all-seeing eye, let's ask the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry what it stands for. So when you see it on the dollar, ask the horse's mouth. They put it there. The all-seeing eye is an all-important symbol of the supreme being borrowed from by the Freemasons from the nations of antiquity. On the same principle, the Egyptians represented Osiris, their chief deity, by the symbol of an open eye and placed the hieroglyphic of him in all their temples. If it's the right eye, it's masculine. If it's the left eye, it's female. doesn't really matter which one it is. You have Isis and Osiris. That's their own source. So that's what it means on the dollar, and it means nothing else. It's the symbol that the Jesuits claim as their main symbol. So all of these symbols have an esoteric and an exoteric meaning. Now, what does that represent? That's the Tower of Babel, correct. Now, as we said, Babel was an attempt to unite all people in apostasy to God. And what did God do? He confounded the languages and gave us another four and a half thousand years for souls to accept him and be saved. What a generous, kind God we have. If it wasn't for that action which has confounded one word of God, just one word, imagine this, one word, and the devil had four and a half thousand years of work. How strong is he really? I don't think he has any strength compared to God whatsoever. He's a liar, and he's been a liar from the beginning. And he could not do what he wanted to do, because God gave his word, and the word was spread abroad. But the serpent, out of the bottomless pit, was going to make war on the word. Don't forget that. We're going to look tomorrow, and the day thereafter, for what he did. Wow. Unbelievable. So, here is the Tower of Babel. This comes from a Masonic source. Above there is the all-seeing eye, and here they are measuring and building. It's interesting that uh, one of the highest politicians in France said, just recently, when they put a poster across the whole of Europe of the temple of the Tower of Babel with a crane on it under construction, he said, we are building a new Babel, and this time we will succeed. Well, we'll see. Well, let's ask the High Freemasons, Arthur Edward Waite, who wrote the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, by the way, he should know what it means. Arthur Edward Waite, as regards Masonry, Babel, of course, represented a Masonic enterprise. It is well known that the Tower of Babel was one of the most ancient traditions of Masonry. There you have it. I have said nothing tonight, please note. Every single statement I have made has been substantiated from their own highest sources. So please don't say that I am presenting things here which are divisive. If you are angry, get in contact with them, not with me. I didn't say it, they said it. Every single statement. 
In the Masonic quiz book, the question is asked, who was Nimrod? The answer is, he was the son of Cush, in the old constitutions referred to as one of the founders of masonry. I thought he was a warrior before the Lord, against the Lord. And in the scriptures as the architect of many cities, in the York manuscript we find at the making of the Tower of Babel there was masonry first much esteemed of and Nimrod was a mason himself and loved well masons. So a mason is nothing other than a harborer of the occult knowledge. Clothing themselves with all their good deeds and their many, many members who they use maliciously and lie to so that they might appear noble. These people are wicked at the highest level. Masonic author Kenneth A. Mackenzie tells us that Hermes was also one of the founders of masonry. Hermes. They used the words like this, like Rameses, for example, son of Ra, Rames. Mes means son of, son of her, her ham, if you like. Elena Petrovna Blavatsky links Hermes and Satan together. So you have to piece the puzzle together. It's very tricky to find out what masonry teaches. You have to go from one source to another because no one author will tell you everything. So let's piece it together. So the one author says Hermes is the one that's important to them. Blavatsky says Hermes is the god of wisdom called Tot, Tat, Set, Set, Satan. And that he was furthermore when viewed under his bad aspect, Typhon of the Egyptian Satan, who was also Set. So when they say they have set, that's Satan. If they say Hermes, that's Satan in his Luciferian form. Doesn't matter. Could be male, female, who cares? One or the other. Arthur Edward Waite writes, in regard to masonry, Babel, of course, represented a Masonic enterprise, and the early expositors reaped full benefit from that fact. They remembered that the people who were of one language and one speech journeyed from the east to the west like those who have tried and proved as master masons. When they reached an abiding place in the land of Shinar, it affirmed that they dwelt therein as Noachidai, being first characteristic name of Masons. It was here that they built the high tower of confusion. Out of evil comes good. Aha! So God was evil when he confused the languages, but they will turn it back to good. Have you got that? And the way to achieve that is to rub them up in chaos destroy them, use them as gun fodder, kill them, do whatever you like, make the pain of separation so great that you will beg for unity. Have you all got that? Now, who are these? Now, that's another lecture. I mustn't digress. It was here that they built the high tower of confusion. Out of evil comes good. However, and the confusions of tongues gave rise to the ancient practice of masons conversing without the use of speech. So if you're going to confuse us with languages, we'll use symbols. So symbolism is a masonic language. Today people tell me, but the symbols are everywhere. Hello, what does that tell you? Who's in control? Everywhere. The Druids of Britain and Gaul had a deep knowledge concerning the mysteries of Isis and worshipped her under the symbol of the moon. The moon was chosen for Isis because of its dom domination over water. The Druids considered the sun to be father and moon, the mother of all things. See to teachings of the ages. So the Druids are the ones who control Great Britain. Winston Churchill belonged to the Druidic order of Freemasonry, and he was a 33 degree Freemason, and I photographed his apron, in case someone doesn't believe that. And so we start finding little tidbits of history that make sense. As you enter the lodge in England, you have to cross the pentagram. And if you look up, you have this statue at the top. It's a shield, and there's a chevron over there. Do you see it? Let's make it a little bit bigger. There it is. Chevron. 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 Do you find it on some cars maybe? Just, just for interest's sake. 
And then, of course, you have other symbolism over here, and you have even the Ark of the Covenant, because he wants to be like the Most High, but he's covering cherubs, have got what kind of feet? Goat's feet. This is Satanism. That's why in masonry you ride the goats. There are many jokes about riding the goats. There are many fun postcards that make fun of it. They have the goats singing hymns. They have the goat doing this, riding the goat, this and that. It's a symbol of Lucifer. We'll see later that they say, goats go to heaven, sheep go to hell. Interesting. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 8 to 14, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. I think we did that tonight. I don't want anything to do with it. But to expose it is necessary. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. What a beautiful word of God we have. No hidden agendas. Jesus says, I have done nothing in secret. I love the God of the Bible. And the mere fact that I am still alive shows that God is almighty. What a wonderful God we serve. What a kind God we serve. I would not want to give up serving him for all the satanic wealth of this world. What does it mean? It means nothing. Jesus is coming soon. And the kingdom of darkness will have had his shot. And it will walk over the blood-stained earth that it has marauded and tortured for the centuries and centuries in wars and battles. But the word of God has remained through all that time. The word of God stands like a rock, the last thing that stands in his way. What a war he has fought against the word of God. And I would like you to come to the next lectures. Because we're going to see what he has done. And it will be fascinating. Fascinating. So tomorrow night we're going to talk about what they did with the Bibles. The battle of the Bibles.